Hey everyone, Dr. Jake Gordy here, and today I'm gonna to be taking you through the life cycle of yeast. And I'm gonna be using the life cycle of yeast to talk to you about a very important biological principle, and that's chemotropism. Um, but I'm also, and you might be wondering, Jack, we're supposed to be learning about the cellular basis of disease. Why do we need to learn about a yeast life cycle? Well, yeast is a very important pathogen. Um, so understanding its life cycle also allows us to understand how to attack yeast, for example, um, to kill it with chemicals, perhaps. But also understanding its life cycle is really important for research. You might wonder why we uh, would ever research yeast uh, massively. Well, yeast are eukaryotes, so they're a great model organism. And there have been at least six Nobel Prizes about major discoveries in yeast, um, including discoveries that are very important for cancer. Uh, and I'm going to go over that in a later video coming up very soon. So next, ba ba ba. Ah, okay. So yeast predominantly lives in these uh, two cell forms. Uh, one, and I think they're named absolutely terrible. They couldn't be more confusingly named. But anyway, one is called the A cell, and one is called the alpha cell. Why not alpha and beta? I don't know. But anyway, one's called the A cell, one's called the alpha cell. Now these are haploid cells, which means they only have one set of chromosomes. The human body, everywhere except for your your gamete production zones uh, contains two sets of chromosomes. So uh, this is kind of unusual. They live around, they live a lot as one, uh, as haploid one set of chromosome cells. Now these guys can undergo asexual cell division. So they just essentially form a bud and then they bud off after duplicating their DNA. And so they are able to sort of go undergo fission to create two cells that are both haploid. So this is technically mitosis, which is quite interesting because it involves one haploid cells, which we typically think of as gametes, but they're only going asexual division. So that's mitosis. You don't have sex with your toe. That's, my, that's, that's how I remember it. Mitosis is, has the word toe in it and you don't have sex with your toe. So if it's not involving sex, it's called mitosis. If it is involving sex, it's called meiosis. Okay, so... These haploid cells can undergo mitosis, which is quite interesting and unique to, um, uh, it's very interesting and unique and very different from our biology. Now, the A cell produces a compound called A factor. Now, um, because it, it produces it, it's gonna be at highest concentrations right beside itself, and then the concentration gradient is gonna drop off as, it, as the chemicals disperse and drift away from it. Now, the alpha cell has receptors on it that can detect the A factor, and it can detect the concentration gradient. And so what the alpha cell will do is will grow towards the A factor up the concentration gradient. And this is a process called positive chemotropism, right? Positive because it's growing towards it. If it was growing away from it, that would be negative. Chemo because it's chemicals. Tropism means growth towards it. So this is positive chemotropism. Now while that's happening, the reverse is happening. The alpha cell is releasing alpha factor that's binding to receptors on the A cell, and the A cell starts to grow towards the alpha cell. So this is called chemotropism, and chemotropism is a growth. Chemotaxis is a movement, like a taxi. You call it, call, call, call the taxi, call the Uber, um, that's a chemotaxis. And again, you can have positive chemotaxis going towards, negative chemotaxis going away. Now, in this little GIF here, we've got a neutrophil, which is an immune cell. I'm going to cover that in a future video, chasing a bacteria. So this immune cell was chasing that bacteria. Now, that bacteria will be unintentionally leaking chemical signals off itself. And the neutrophil, all it has to do is follow the concentration gradient to hunt down that bacteria to engulf it and kill it. Very, very cool. We're going to go over the immune system, which is the greatest thing in all of biology, the immune system, uh, in a later video. So let's discuss the differences between chemotropism and chemotaxis. So chemotropism, the biggest difference is it's a growth, whereas chemotaxis is a movement. But there are other differences. One is it's slow. Growth is typically slow, whereas movement is typically much faster. If you look at this, this is happening over the periods of minutes. This happens over the period of an hour or so. So this is uh, quite slow. This is quite fast. And it's very local. Because it's a growth, uh, uh, it's often very local. 
and it typically happens over the distance of very small distances. There are the rare exception, but for the most part, uh, for example, these yeast cells won't grow if it's further than the width of another yeast cell. So it's very local, right? It, it could only really just start a small growth um, about half the width of a yeast cell. Chemotaxis is movement, so it's much faster. Um, and it could be a, a local thing, like what's going on with this neutrophil here, or it could be quite distant. Sometimes moths can be attracted to pheromones kilometers away. That's an example of chemotaxis, positive chemotaxis. Um, but also, like if there's an infection in my brain, say it's cerebral malaria, I can release signaling molecules that tells my bone marrow in my leg to release immune cells. So, uh, and that will happen chemo and they can then go up the concentration gradient, for example. So it can, it can happen also over a long range and a local range. And they can both be positive towards or negative away. Now, what happens when their tips touch? So the, <laughs> the two yeast cells, they touch their tips. Um, oh, I'm not even gonna touch that. Anyway, and then they fuse. Uh, and then when they fuse, they can form one diploid cell. That's typically bigger than the two haploid cells and their chromosomes will fuse. So now for the first time, they have two sets of chromosomes, which is our normal state, and they can uh, quite happily stay in this state for a wee while too. Now, in a diploid cell, they can also undergo mitosis. So it's quite a complicated life form, isn't it? So here, they can undergo just uh, a diploid uh, mitosis where they can produce more of them. Um, but if you stress them out a little bit, the diploid cells, say you... Uh, uh, deprive them of nutrients or start to dry them out, uh, they will undergo meiosis, which is sexual cell division, which first is duplicating the DNA and then splitting it so each one only gets one set of chromosomes. So now we end up with uh, haploid spores. And these will be in a hard case that are super robust, right? So these spores are really robust, can handle the environment. That's why when you stress them, the cells think, okay, I can't stay this moist, happy cell. I need to go form spores because the conditions around me aren't conducive to life anymore. So I need to go into my more robust form, which is spores. Now, the creation of spores is called sporulation. It's not really an important term, but it makes kind of sense. So it forms haploid spores. Now, these spores can often fly about. If you were to sample the air right now, it would be full of yeast spores everywhere. Um, and that's why, you know, when you make wine, you don't need to add yeast to it. There's already yeast all over the, um, all over the grapes because there's yeast everywhere in the environment. And in fact, our friend Louis Pasteur, uh, he found that if you clean the surface of grapes, you prevent their ability from producing uh, wine. And that's how one of the ways he discovered that yeast, a living organism, was causing wine. Now, if we tie this all together, the spores can then go find a new place that's delicious for life and form either an alpha or an A cell. So the life cycle looks like this. Each of them can divide in their haploid state, or they can fuse and touch their tips, um, or they can undergo uh, fission over here and divide again, um, and then, or if they get stressed out, they can undergo meiosis and go through this process here. So this is the entire yeast life cycle there. Um, but a really key fundamental point there was chemotropism and uh, chemotaxis, as well as meiosis and mitosis, and fun little things like that. So up in the next video, we're finally going to get into the disease point of the fungus. And we're going to look at uh, a case study of Candida albicans, which is one of the most common infections ever, uh, fungal infections. And this is an esophagus here covered in a fungal infection all the way down the throat, which is horrible. And I will cover that in my next video. Cheers, team.